I don't think Walter needs much introduction. Um, everybody knows he's a great author, written a dozen books. You know Henry Kissinger's line when somebody said that? What? That I may not need a great introduction, but nobody enjoys one more. Right, it's probably true. Uh, so you would enjoy an introduction? No, that's right. No. All right, well, here's an introduction. No, no. <laughs> From New Orleans, went to Harvard, Rhodes Scholar, uh, rose up at Time Magazine to be the editor of Time Magazine, then the president of CNN, then was the CEO of uh, the Aspen uh, Institute for a number of years, and now is a professor at Tulane University, and he's moved back to his native New Orleans. And he has written books on geniuses, including the aforementioned Henry Kissinger, um, more, most recently G, uh, Jennifer Doudna, and then also uh, Steve Jobs, Leonardo da Vinci, among others. And now he has a new genius, um, I guess. Mad genius. Elon Musk. Um, I should also mention did Benjamin Franklin, who of all the people you've written about, if you could have dinner with anyone. Oh, I mean, Ben Franklin, man, he's great. He opens up the big barrel of port when George Washington comes to Philadelphia. He's like you, he throws good parties. Okay, so, okay, so um, you finished a book on Jennifer Doudna, and it, you timed it well because the Nobel Committee, when your book came out, just about gave her the Nobel Prize. So did you know in advance she was going to win? No, it's very hard to hack the Nobel oh. Prize Committee voting machines, but uh, we worked that. I did stay up. She didn't, but it's 4 a.m. in New Orleans, and you know they're about to announce it, and I did stay up that night. All right, so that was good timing, it. and now you have um, a book. How did you decide to do Elon Musk as opposed to, I assume you have a lot of people who are presumed to be geniuses will call you and say, by the way, I'm a genius, can you write a book on me? <laughs> well, you actually did, I don't know if you remember, say, I, no, 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 I'm not saying you called me, I'm saying you told me to do Elon Musk. You said it was the most interesting character around. Well, was, no, he hasn't called. I uh, called me, but uh, I, yes, you're right, I did suggest You he, did suggest it, and when you, for which thank you, I think. Um, and when you suggested it, it was so interesting to me because I love the intersection right. of technology, business, humanity. And he's bringing us into the era of electric vehicles almost single-handedly after uh, GM and Ford have gotten out of it and into space travel and dealing with artificial intelligence. So I said, this is a great book uh, of technology. And then, of course, it became a wild ride. Right. So when you have an idea for someone like Elon Musk, you call him up and say, guess what, this is your lucky day, I'm gonna yeah. write a book about you. How, did, how hard was it to convince him to do it? There's a guy, uh, Antonio Gracias, you may know, at Valor Capital, who's on the Aspen Institute board and also an old friend of Musk. And he kept saying you ought to do it. So one day, he put us together by phone, and we talked for an hour and a half, Musk and myself. And I said, if I do it, I'd like to not just do it based on a few interviews, but I want to take two years and be by your side, one week a month, wherever you go, every meeting, nothing off limits. And secondly, I don't want you to have any control over the book, and I'm not going to let you read it in advance. And he went, okay, just in a monotone. I went, wow. And then I was with a group of people. I had gone somewhere to take the call, came back, and they said, my God, we didn't know you are doing Musk. So what do you mean? He said, well, he just tweeted out that Walter Isaacson's writing my Bible. I said, wait, I haven't even told my, I hadn't told Simon & Schuster yet. So um, he did honor his commitment, basically let you spend two years with him. You spent roughly two years going to any meeting you wanted to, is that right? Yeah, the only exceptions, uh, which are somewhat relevant, were ones that were uh, high classified uh, discussions, like with General Milley. Okay, all right, so um, how did you come up with a clever title? <laughs> You know, I've always, uh, all my books are unclever titled, meaning okay. Ben Franklin, Albert Einstein, Elon Musk. I figure you might as well be straightforward. So after spending roughly two years with him. Uh, uh, your friend Kissinger, if I can do one more joke of his. Yes, go ahead. I, I did a book on Kissinger, it's just called, you know, Henry Kissinger. And somebody said to him, do you like the book? And he says, I love the title. <laughs> you might tell people when uh, he didn't actually like anything other than the title. And so he stopped talking to you for a while. And then what happened? Time Magazine, when I was the editor, decided to invite for its anniversary everybody who had been on the cover of Time. And of course, he was invited. And I didn't know if he'd come. Phone rings. And my assistant says, it's Dr. Kissinger. I pick up the phone. He goes, Little Walter. 
And uh, my first reaction is, this is Graydon Carter, who does a great imitation playing a joke on me, so I just don't say anything. He says, even the 30 years war had to end at some point. I will come to your party. But his wife? His, and then I paused and said, that's great. We'd love to have you and Nancy. He says, well, you know Nancy. She's partial to the 100 years war, and we're going to have to work on her. So, um, OK, so you trail him for roughly two years. And when, and when you're doing that, um, you come away with a sense now that he is truly an incredible genius, but personality is a little bit complicated. Or most geniuses have complicated personal lives and other kinds of psychiatric issues. Yeah, and him tenfold, you know, order of magnitude greater, because all people have dark and light strands interwoven. I came away feeling he was much more of an engineering genius, especially when it came to creating assembly lines and factories and products and understanding with a fingertip feel the uh, material properties of everything from ink and L to stainless steel. But also he had zero emotional, well, uh, close to zero emotional receptors and that lack of empathy, and this is a very complicated thing in the book, uh, that lack of empathy, his brother says, is actually makes him a, I can't use the word, it begins with A, uh, but it also is one of his superpowers, which is he can care about the mission and not care about who he crushes when he goes to it. So uh, we won't dwell on it, but his upbringing was a little complicated. Uh, you might just summarize. Yeah, he had, uh, you know, he knew pain. He was in South Africa and he used to get beaten up all the time, went to a wilderness camp where they encouraged the kids to fight over the food and, you know, he's scrawny and socially awkward. Second time he went, he had gotten bigger. He said, I just learned to punch everybody in the nose as hard as I could. And even though they beat me up, at least I had punched them in the nose. And it's almost a metaphor for later. But when he gets beaten up in at the schoolyard as a kid, he has to go to the hospital at one point because they smash him on the concrete steps. And those scars were nothing compared to when he gets home his father makes him stand in front of his father for an hour and a half, and the father berates him for being a loser, for being stupid, for takes the side of the person who beat him up. And so that's one of the dark demons that still dance in his head. His mother, May, said, about when I was starting to write the book, here's your theme, the danger is that Elon becomes his father. So he ultimately, the parents divorce, um, she's, gets tired of being abused by the father. She moves to a different part of South Africa. And then the three children they have, Elon's brother and his sister, move with her for at least a while. Then they move back with the father. What's really interesting is at age 12, Elon, who's living with his mother, who is, a, you know her, is a delightful person, decides to move back with the father. And that's a deeply psychological thing. He says, I was made for the storm. I like drama. And his brother says he associates pain with love uh, because he just wanted to be with his father who psychologically abused him. So his father and he don't talk anymore, is that right? He, definitely not, yeah. And His uh, father also had two children by what was his stepdaughter. In other words, his father remarried, and then he, after he remarried, he divorced his second wife, but the stepdaughter he had with the second wife, in effect, he then married her and had yeah. two children with her. Wow, you read the book carefully. So, yes. but, uh, I had trouble. Well, yeah. It's unusual. So that's right, more or less? Yes, that's exactly OK, right. so how does he come to the United States? Uh, why did, and how did he 17 get... years old, he's basically a runaway. And look, if you have a common theme on things, people who are misfits as kids, whether it be Le uh, Leonardo being born out of wedlock, his dad won't legitimate him, he's gay, he's from the village of Vinci, he runs away to Ben Franklin running away because he's been apprenticed by his father to his brother. Uh, obviously Einstein and Kissinger leaving at that age because of a misfit. And so it happens to Elon at age 17. He just basically runs away, can't get into the United States, but goes to Canada because his mother's father was from Canada. Okay, so he gets, eventually he gets into the United States and he goes to the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are you on the board there too? No, no. Okay, <laughs> I didn't go there. But he goes to the University of Pennsylvania. I couldn't get into Duke <laughs> or Harvard. So, um, okay. So he, um, all right, he goes to the University of Pennsylvania and he graduates, right? Yeah, physics and business. But he, but his board scores, as you got access to them, 
are not 800 SAT. You know, uh, yeah, you really did read this book. Uh, it's interesting about geniuses is that they aren't necessarily the smartest people, meaning the ones with the most mental processing power. Uh, they tend to be the people who think different, as Steve Jobs would say, and that was him. All right, so he did okay, he gets in the pen, and then he decides he's gonna go to get a PhD at Stanford. One day, drops out after and a he day. He lasted a day. Because he wants to start his own company. There's Silicon Valley and the irrational exuberance. Here. So he starts a company that later becomes Zip2. Yeah, but right? more importantly, of course, is the payment and social media company he starts called X.com. And that's his second company after he was successful with Zip2. And he wants it to be an everything app where you can transfer payments and money, you can be part of a social circle, you can post content and people will pay for it. And he does, it is pretty good. And he and Peter Thiel merge their companies and Peter Thiel ends up winning the battle to call it PayPal rather than X.com and then ousts Elon. And for 20 years or so, Elon's saying, I want to fulfill that vision of X.com of a social media company that includes payments, so which is he, what you're now He was saying. part of PayPal, he merged his company to PayPal, and then they pushed him out as a CEO. So he's wandering around, he's got some money, and then ultimately PayPal is sold, he gets some real money. Yeah, definitely, and he has two companies that he's sold for quite a bit, and everybody thinks he's gonna relax. He, you know, they uh, get a vacation, and he says, I always want to put my chips back on the table. I hate the calm. I want the storm. And so he decides, I want to build a rocket company to send rockets to Mars. They stage an intervention with him in which they make a highlights reel of every rocket blowing up and stuff. He says, you don't get it. That's what I, I know I might go bankrupt, but I need to push this mission. So his mission was not necessarily to do what SpaceX became initially. Yeah. It was to get to Mars to save the, the species. You know, I always thought that that was like the type of pontificating you do on podcasts or at pep talks for your team, which is we have to get humanity to Mars. And after a while, after that mantra came over and over again, I'd hear him mumbling it to himself. He would be walking through the launch pad down in South Texas or just sitting in the car. He said, we have to get humanity. And I think he truly believes that mission and he's mission driven. He had three missions coming out of college. Get us to the era of sustainable energy, to electric vehicles, batteries and solar roofs. Get us humanity to Mars. And he had read Isaac Asimov once too often and believed that we had to keep artificial intelligence from harming humanity. And as you said, with satellites, he backfills. Once he has a mission, he says, okay, my mission is to get to Mars. What's the best way to do it? Oh, these rockets can launch communication satellites. I can make a ton of money by recreating the internet in low Earth orbit. But that wasn't his original goal. That's just a way to fund the mission. So he gets SpaceX off the ground. Um, and where does he get the money for that? Is it his money? It's his money. And of course, in 2007 and then early 2008, they blow up the first three rockets because unlike NASA or Boeing or anything else, he's just like, OK, it may work. Let's try and fail and fail fast and then iterate. And so, he, of course, he runs out of money. And I know I'm jumping ahead, but also Tesla runs out of money. In 2008, zero money. And he's writing money out of his personal checkbook to try to keep this fourth launch going and Tesla going. So the first three launches blow up on the blow up. The fourth launch works. And it's right at the end of 2008. Everything is gone. He is uh, sort of staying up all night. Tallulah Riley, his second wife, is like holding his head as he vomits. He has such stress, but he loves the stress. And in December, Christmas Eve, both companies are out of money. But then the fourth rocket attempt goes up and karma happens because he had this huge fight with Peter Thiel and everything else when he's ousted. But he decided to try, and he's not very empathetic, but he decided, all right, maybe you guys are right. And he stays friends with them. And in December, late 2008, they all chip in to keep uh, SpaceX alive. All right, so he gets the money to keep SpaceX going, and SpaceX becomes the thing that NASA used to be. It used to be you know, NASA was launching uh, rockets, and now he's launching the rockets for spy. Yeah, NASA gave up sending astronauts into orbit with the grounding of the space shuttle 12 years ago. No entity 
has been, no entity in the world has been able, country or company, to launch rockets of things into orbit, like I said, and then re-land the rocket upright. And was that his it. idea to re-land it so it's reusable? Or so, yeah, it was his idea, but you're, <laughs> I don't know if this will amuse you. Uh, Jeff Bezos is like one click. He patents the idea of re-landing rockets upright. Now, he's never done it, and somehow your friends at the U.S. Patent Office provisionally give him a patent, and Musk is actually trying to do it. Didn't even think you could patent the idea. And they do have a, Bezos backs off. Okay, so he lands these uh, rockets on drone back and they're ships. reusable. Yeah, on Boise Bollinger, um, Mitch, Boise Bollinger has these drone, whatever they are, flat uh, things in the Gulf of Mexico and he lands them. So SpaceX ultimately evolves into another business that he has, uh, Starlink. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what Starlink is? Well, that was a way to make money, which is he realized that internet and communication services, at least a trillion dollar business. If he can get 3% of it, then he has a budget larger than NASA. And so uh, surprisingly, nobody else has been able to launch these satellites that can be in low Earth orbit. I don't know that Scott even has had to figure out, do we use them for airplane travel? Because it's used for boats now. And uh, he's launched almost 5,000 of them. Uh, the amount of satellites or mass he has launched to orbit is greater than the total of everything launched by every country and every company in the world. So he's got more. And so he's able to recreate the internet in low Earth orbit. So recently, part of your book, you made a correction mm -hmm. on part of it. But explain how Starlink became so important that the yeah. war in Ukraine was dependent on it. Yeah, and the correction doesn't change the thrust of the fact that he had the only satellites and he got to decide whether they could be used or not. Are you convinced in this when he war. told you that? Yeah, yeah, well, what happened was uh, in March, Ukraine invades Russia and Teledesic, which is what they were using, gets knocked out. All the military satellites, no communication between the Ukrainian and the military, you know, they can't control their troops. And the only communication that, that, that isn't able to be disabled by the Russians is Starlink. So you see that first night, all the text messages are in the book. Can you help us? Can you save us? And Musk, having read, you know, hero comics as a kid, feels he's the hero in the world stage. He sends 100, 200, then 1,000 Starlink dishes to, the, to Ukraine. And uh, they use it. And without them, they would have been crushed uh, in the first week of the war. What happens in September of that year is I'd been a week with Musk down in Texas. I finally get back to New Orleans. It's a Friday night, and my high school football team is playing. I know that sounds ridiculous. Only one person here holds this. And it's Arch Banning's one of his last home games. So, you know, all sorts of people. We're going to see, phone keeps ringing. It's Elon. I finally go underneath the bleachers at the Newman School. And he's saying to me, they're using Starlink to do a sneak Pearl Harbor attack on the Russian fleet in Crimea. And I'm not allowing it. I'm not going to allow it. I'm not going to allow it. I'm going, wow. And, and the Ukrainians don't know. So I wrote in the book, he turned off Starlink in the Crimean coast. Then he later said, no, it had been geofenced before then. The issue that night was whether I should enable it for this attack. So w whichever way it was, he has the power that night to make the attack fail or succeed, and he allows it to fail. Okay, so um, the business is part of SpaceX. SpaceX is a privately owned company still, mm -hmm. has a market value uh, last round, well over, a, uh, I guess, over a trillion dollars last round or something. I've never like argued that. with the valuation so, of the so, Carlisle Group. So um, when is he going to when is he going to take that public? You think? You know, he hates taking things public. As you know, famously in 2018, he announced he was taking Tesla private and that he had funding from the Saudis, which was not exactly true in four years of lawsuits because of that. I, I think he has zero desire to take SpaceX public. Right. Now, he doesn't need to. Now, SpaceX is... Oh. And by the way, the reason SpaceX succeeds is it takes enormous risks. Um, things that, you know, neither Boeing or Lockheed or Rockwell or 
NASA would do. And I think he feels that if he were a public company, it would constrain him. But what's the obsession with X? He has SpaceX, he's renamed Twitter X, he has a child named X too. So why, what is the, Yeah, where yeah, and X.com and XAI is his AI company because as a very lonely kid who had no friends, he would sit in the corner of the bookstores in Pretoria and then later and read comics. And the X-Men comics, all named X, uh, he became, he thought it was a great mystery, unknown letter. There's something in the book that's very poignant too, because he named his, well, his firstborn child dies in infancy. And then his next child, he named Xavier after the comics. And she transitions and becomes, a, at age 16, and becomes Jenna and rejects him totally. Says, you know, I hate Bill, you know, she's a very progressive thinking and changes her name, won't, goes to court, so she doesn't have to have anything to do with him. And this pains him so much too, and it's also in that mysterious X factor. How many children does he have? Uh, surviving children, he has 10, because there's one more than people knew from Claire Boucher. How many women were the mothers of those 10 Three. children? Three. There was, um, just seen his first wife, Claire Boucher, the actress. And is he married now? No, but he's got young children by both Siobhan Zillis, who Thank runs Neuralink, and by Claire Boucher, known as Grimes. Well, let's go to another company that many people in the public know better because they buy the product, which is Tesla. Mm -hmm. Did he start Tesla? No, but that's uh, a whole chapter called The Founders, because as I think half the people in this room can relate to, any failure is somebody else's idea, but when it's successful, a lot of people say, I, you know, I started that company. There, was, uh, th there were three groups. There was J.B. Straubel, I won't go into it in too much detail, but he's trying to start a battery car company. There's Martin Epperhardt and Mark Tarpening, who had no money and nothing, but they had registered the name Tesla and they wanted to do it. And then Musk, Musk meets with all of them and funds this group and all five of them become involved as usual with Musk, there's a falling out later, and they actually had a lawsuit in which all five get to be called founders. Okay, so the agreement on the, if the lawsuit is they're all gonna be called founders, but he is really the funder of it and ultimately becomes the CEO. Right, he funded it totally. He was the chair at the beginning and he ousts everybody else. And how easy was it to get the first car off the Well, you know, here's an interesting factory. thing for you know, Economic Club or whatever. The problem with the first car was he had done, they had done what every automaker and lots of other companies did in America, which is the auto industry went from making 80% of its IP to about 30%. They outsource everything. So the first Tesla, the batteries are made in Japan. They're shipped to Thailand, to a place that used to make barbecue pits to become the battery pack. Then they're shipped to England where Lotus puts them in a chassis and the French make the thing. Then they go back to, anyway. It is a far-flung, stupid supply chain that supposedly saves money, but it burns cash and it also doesn't allow you to keep control. He, like Steve Jobs, feels you have to have end-to-end -end control, otherwise you can't innovate. And so he brings the manufacturing back to America and believes that the building of the assembly line is as important as the design of the product. And he makes his designers sit on the assembly line so they can see every little design they make, what implications. And he's a person that likes to sleep overnight in the uh, factory just to be there all the time. He, I mean, he's almost compelled at times when he does, and certainly doesn't need to, right after Grimes had their third child and Siobhan was pregnant with twins, uh, and they didn't know, and they were both in the same hospital. Uh, it was Thanksgiving, and he flies out to Los Angeles because he says he's got a problem with Tesla, and he sleeps on the factory floor. It's like Thanksgiving weekend, and I'm knowing he just is getting away from these months. But he wants a surge at the factory there to make sure they can make the, because they hit a million cars that period. So um, people are saying that Tesla is going to go bankrupt. The short sellers are oh, after right. him. And he is determined to beat the short seller. So what does he do to kind of meet the target that he's supposed to get, which is I think 5,000 cars? Yeah, 5,000 a week. And this is 2018. He's in a total tailspin. It's when his father has just had a, I mean, yeah, his father just had a child with a stepdaughter. Amber Heard has just broken up with him. He's having issues that he considers probably bipolar. So he's getting medicated. 
He's lying on the factory floor, sometimes catatonic. But he decides that if they can't get to 5,000 cars a week, the short sellers are going to win. And he thinks the short sellers are evil. Uh, and they have inside information. They have drones. They're looking at how much the two assembly lines in Fremont, California can do per week. And they know there's no way it can do more than 3,700 cars. And so they, it's the most shorted stock in history. And at a certain point, Musk, who loves World War II military history, says they used to build the fighter planes in the parking lots because they needed to do enough. There's a provision in the uh, California law that if you're a car you know, service place, you can erect a temporary tent. It's like for muffler shops to be able to do one. He builds a tent almost, as, well, actually more longer than this room and wider uh, in the parking lot behind Tesla without a permit. Uh, and within two weeks, he tells his people, we've got to build this tent. And they have an assembly line. They can't even get a permit to have a motorized assembly line. So they put it on an incline. So the cars roll down at the right speed and everybody's assembling it. And the last day of the month, the car that comes off the line just writes 5,000 on it. The stock becomes pretty quickly worth more than all the next nine car companies combined. And short sellers, you probably know more than I do on the numbers, lost more on that short than ever. So, but Tesla today is a company that is very successful, you would say? Oh, God, yeah. And SpaceX is very successful. But he has taken on another, because in his spare time he didn't have a, anything to do, he took on another company called Twitter. Why did he buy Twitter? Complex, and you know, I'm there right when he's opening Gigafactory, the big factory in Austin, and everything is going well. They've just done a million cars, uh, 33 rocket launches in a row landed safely and got astronauts and uh, cargo into orbit. And I even talked to him about, you know, you've got to be pretty satisfied. He said, you don't get it. I, I don't like enjoyment. I don't like to be satisfied. I need a storm. I need drama. And that's when he says uh, that he's buying Twitter stock secretly. And there's almost an intervention there, too, that early April, where his friends, his brother Kimball, Antonio, Ken Howry, his son Griffin, he has an autistic son named Saxon, his mother is there, we're all having dinner at the Pershing and stuff, and they're all saying, you can't do this, really, you don't have a feel for social media. Well, that's not a good thing, so he gets pushed. He leaves kind of abruptly to go to Larry Ellison's house in um, Lanai, Hawaii, uh, meeting another girlfriend, um, Natasha Bassett, I think her name is, Australian, and just stays up three nights in a row and starts sending these text messages to the Twitter management. You don't know what you're doing. You've not improved things. And I had asked him, I said, man, what, you, social media company, that doesn't seem to be your... He said, no, it's an engineering problem. It's a technology company. And I'm thinking, no, it's an advertising medium to gather emotional eyeballs for brands. But... He doesn't feel that way. And so after three days in Hawaii texting them, he says, I'm going to go hostile on you. Then flies to Vancouver, where he's meeting Grimes with his son X to introduce him to his grandparents. And he's, they release a game called Elden Ring, which you and I are a little bit too old to know, but it like becomes this phenomenon. He stays up till 5.30 in the morning playing Elden Ring. And at about 5.35, he sends out a message, I made an offer. So this is a crazed, ambient, and Red Bull-fueled four nights making an offer. And then half the time after that, he's thinking, how do I get out of this? Um, the reason he does it is, first of all, he wants, he's, I said, what are you doing? He said, I want to fulfill my vision for X.com, the one he had done 20 years earlier. We have to have a social media platform that's like WeChat that allows people to pay, et cetera. Secondly, between being attacked by the Biden administration, Elizabeth Warren, he's paid more taxes than anybody in history has ever paid to anything. But Elizabeth Warren says he's avoiding taxes. So he's getting his backup. He thinks the quote, woke mind virus has infected Twitter. Uh, and he just loves the product and he wants the storm. All right, so he ultimately goes ahead and buys it, even though he wishes he hadn't at one point. That way, you know, there are many Elon Musk, and you can be with him in the middle of the day, and he's like, 
yelling at Alex Spiro, his lawyer, saying, fight it in Delaware. This is ridiculous. She can't, meaning the chancellor, can't force me to do it. And then late at night, he's giddy, talking about this is going to be the okay. booster for at, X.com. At this moment, is he happy that he owns it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, happy is a word that does not apply to his emotions often. Okay. He is... Um, energized and crazed about owning it. And it's a bad thing for him because he's also tweeting like crazy and crazy is the right word for someone. But he's running SpaceX, he's running uh, Tesla, and he's also running this company. Right, and if you don't mind me jumping ahead, in March of this year, right as he's trying to launch the largest movable object ever made, Starship, he says, you gotta come back to Austin. This is, uh, and I'm thinking I'm finishing the book, uh, I have to talk to you, but I can't do it over the phone. We got it. So I go, and he's at Siobhan's house. We sit in the back. And he says, Larry Page uh, at Google and Microsoft with OpenAI, they're a danger to the planet because they're going to make unsafe AI. I'm going to start an AI company. At this point, counting the number of companies and counting the number of children becomes a mathematical problem. Like, all right, is that now seven companies you're running? So he actually helped start OpenAI, is that right? He did it because uh, DeepMind, he had invested in, Demis Hassabis's company that comes up with the notion of pure machine learning, that Larry Page, who used to be Musk's best friend, Musk used to stay at his house in Palo Alto, buys DeepMind and Musk gets furious thinking Larry Page doesn't care about AI safety. And so he starts OpenAI with Sam Altman but then decides he wants to do it in-house at Tesla because correctly he believes that all these little chatbots that everybody's been excited about with large language model generative, that's okay, but that's mainly a parlor trick. What counts as real world AI, meaning right. cars that can drive themselves, robots that can walk this room and figure things out, that transforms our life and economy. And that requires right. visual data, not just language data. And that's what he has, because he has 8 billion frames a day from Tesla cars. So um, oh, he has his now, he is, has his new artificial X intelligence. XAI. Okay. Which, not to be confused with X.com, what about X the Sun. What about Neuralink? What is that? You know, one of the, all the great advances of the digital age is ways to make us closely connect with our computers better. Whether it's Steve Jobs at his last board meeting that I went to, where they show him Siri and you could talk to the phone, or Doug Engelbart before that with the graphical user interface. The ultimate connection of humans and machines is a chip that can read your brain signals and do things. They have already made one, uh, Neuralink, that allows a monkey to play Pong just by thinking. Uh, about right. it. And for Musk, if you're connected to a higher vision, it's he believes that AI, artificial intelligence, will run out of control, will no longer be guided by human agency unless we can have an extremely tight connection between our minds and our machines. And that is this epic vision for Neuralink, but typically, as Starlink is to SpaceX, He's using it to help people with ALS and paralyzed. Uh, right. That's going to be his business model. All right. So do you think he will live to a normal age, old age, and get to be 80 years old and just live a nice retired life? At now, point? I mean, I'm not sure I want to, you know, go there too much, but he really does not take care of himself. He's in incredible stress. He, you know, has can't sleep. He's... Uh, you know, if I were, he has some doctors that prescribe many things for him, uh, my doctor would probably but he, ask for a different He's lifestyle. bipolar, you would say. He says he's never been diagnosed, but then that 2018 period when he became catatonic so often, he said, I guess I may be, and he says he has Asperger's, he says this, that, and the other. It'd be useful if he actually went to some doctors who told him exactly Multiple personality disorder, too? Definitely with that. I don't know if that's a, I shouldn't say, because I don't know if that's a, whatever that's called, a diagnostic manual thing. But he goes from Jekyll to Hyde, just like his father did. His mother said, this is it. He'll be in a really happy, giddy mode. And sometimes, like, walking late at night in front of the launch pad in the Gulf of Mexico, those of us from the Gulf Coast, we can feel when the atmosphere is changing and the storm is about, you could see him get dark 
and he becomes a demon. And that's what Grimes calls a demon mode. And when he snaps out of it, like Dr. Jekyll, he doesn't remember what he did as Mr. Hyde. So is it easier to write a book about a genius who's alive or who's dead? Dead. Dead. I didn't know that when you told me to do Musk. So is your next one going Well, I mean, as you know, after I did Kissinger, which was a bit of a much, I said, okay, I'm going back 200 years, you know, to Ben Frank. And then after Steve Jobs, I was like, okay, I'm going back to Leonardo. This time, I think so Aristotle, Socrates. You're going to find somebody who's been dead for a while, your next book. Yeah, but somebody who's at the intersection of science and art and humanities probably doesn't have to be dead a thousand years. I've got a couple ideas. Okay. So, well, it's a great book, a great read. It's number one bestseller uh, now, right? Because of Elon, not because of me, but thank you. Mm. Okay. So um, today, um, do you think if you saw Elon, he would be happy and congratulate you on getting him? Or he would say, I wish I hadn't done that? The interesting thing is, I don't know. He's posted a few things that are fine. Uh, about parts of the book. He jokingly said, Walter told me not to read the book, so I haven't. Is that true? I don't know. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to find out, but I'm, you know. It, here's the main thing, and this is what Kathy, my wife, and my editor helped me do. Every sentence, every paragraph, I have to say this is aimed at the reader. The good, the bad, the ugly, it's there as a story to help the reader understand. I'm not writing it within the back of my mind saying, how is Elon Musk gonna feel? And you just have to cut off thinking about that. Otherwise, you, you only have one client, and that's your reader. So the book is written in a different style than your other books. Yeah. It's, you know, the uh, chapters are a couple pages. I tried to do the frenetic, by the end especially, the frenetic life of Elon Musk, meaning, you know, on a given day when the Twitter board accepts his offer, he flies down to Boca Chica to worry about a methane leak for two hours in Starship. And then he's jumping around, and he's not a multitasker. He's a serial tasker where he'll spend two hours super focused and then leap to something totally different. And I wanted the book to be incredibly fast-paced, as if it's, I mean, I'm not good at movies, but one of these movies with quick cuts because it captures the freneticness of his life. Is this going to be made into a movie, you think? Yeah, but Who's going I to am... Who's play Elon Musk? Uh, at one point, he joked he wanted Benedict Cumberbatch, and I was about to say he's too good-looking, too tall, too skinny. Uh, I'm not very good, as you know, on movies, and uh, I'm... Walter, um, I know you've had a lot of uh, demands on your schedule since your book came out, so I want to thank you for coming here. Hey, thanks, here, David. And thank you for... Um, you know, giving us insights in this book. I highly recommend it. I think everybody has a copy. So thank, thank you very you. much. And thanks for getting okay. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.